Jackson present. Charles Rodeau Williams present. David Cohen present. <laughs> Zachary Epps present. Dan Schultz present. And Ms. Haywood? Yes, Julie Haywood present. Thank you. And, welcome. and Jennifer Lowen present. Uh, then I'll ask for a motion to, uh, to approve the minutes from the last set of first meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, so I'm going to turn this presentation over now to Ms. Keene. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm looking forward to discussing multi tier system of supports with you all this evening. I know it's a hot topic. Um, and so I'm excited to talk about the framework and how we've been implementing it this school year and some of the work that we have been doing. So, as we do for all of our educational affairs meetings, we start with our mission and our vision statement. And as you will see throughout our discussion this evening, the framework that we have developed for MTSS aligns very nicely with our mission and our vision statement, especially around providing resources uh, for our students for academic achievement, as well as for their social emotional well-being. So what is MTSS? It is a proactive and preventative framework that integrates data as it informs our instruction and our educational practices within the classroom, as well as it drives our decisions on how we support our students' social and emotional well-being and their behavioral needs while in the school setting. To oversimplify it and to make it as plain as possible, it's what all of our students need, what some of our students need, and what do a few of our students need. And so within this simplified version of what MTSS is, it allows our schools and allows our framework to be personalized based on the needs of our students in that individual building. Okay. So what that means is if we have an intervention or a resource that we utilize for some, but we're realizing that our data says that what we're using for some could benefit all, we can move those interventions and those strategies into different tiers. So all is tier one, some is tier two, and few is tier three. And that can be as personalized as we want it to be based on the needs of our students. I'm going to use the term strategy and intervention in tandem while we we're talking about um, our process, but I wanted to explain to you all what the difference is between the two terms. A strategy is an effective instructional tool that can be used within the classroom. Generally, at our tier one level, we can use strategies. Intervention is a research evidence-based practice that we can implement for our students. So an example of a strategy is repeating instructions or how we are setting up our classrooms, how we are differentiating instruction within our classrooms to meet our students' needs. That is a strategy. A intervention would be one of our programs, IXL, that we're using in small group instruction that's evidence-based. And also for behavior, an intervention would be check-in, check-out which is largely implemented by our counselors, but we have some additional staff, which I can't wait to tell you all about later <clears> in the presentation, <throat> that can also help with that endeavor as well. So as we refined our framework, we looked at our meeting structure. And so I will say last year, there was no clear delineation between our tier one meetings and then our advanced tiers meetings, which would be tier two and tier three. So how we are addressing that this year, is that tier one meetings are more so our PLCs, our kid talk meetings, our grade team meetings, where individual groups of teachers are having discussions about students that they're seeing some early warning indicators, which we will talk about in the next couple of slides, and they're not necessarily meeting their grade level targets. They will bring these students up in their tier one meetings and talk about some overall tier one strategies that they can put in place to assist with any of the deficits that they may be seeing. If those deficits are still being seen within that student after about 30 days of progress monitoring, then we are doing a MTSS referral for advanced tiers, tier two and tier three. And within that, we'll talk about the referral form a little later on as well. Then it gets bumped up to those advanced tiers where we will discuss the more individualized, personalized interventions for that student. So a lot of the 
I would say nitty gritty is by our teachers. They are with our students. They are seeing their performance on a day to day, and they are the baseline and the gatekeepers to the students then getting bumped up to our advanced tiers meetings. In our advanced tiers, we have our principals and our assistant principals that are present. We have central office staff, myself. I try to get to as many meetings as possible, except Fridays when there are four meetings scheduled at the same time. So we are working that out. Uh, Dr. Riley and Ms. Collins are also uh, participating in meetings as well. We have our specialists, ELA and math. We have our school counselors, our school psychologists, classroom teachers when applicable and necessary, they can come and provide additional information about students. We have a board certified behavior analyst. We have our BCBAs through special ed, but we also have a gen ed BCBA, who I think has been extremely helpful as we work through this process and providing some behavioral interventions while we are in the meetings. And then our school social workers are a new addition to our meetings this year. Uh, we felt that it was important to include them because they have kind of the connection between home and school at times. And they also, um, spearhead our attendance incentives and initiatives and so we look at attendance as one of the early warning indicators so it's important to have their feedback in the meetings as well and then our data analysts when they are up and running will also be attending these meetings and helping us <coughs> um, look at some of the data as we are discussing students so we developed early warning indicators for academic support and for behavior support um, what's important is that we want to look at multiple data sources as we are bringing up students and feeling that they need some additional support and intervention through MTSS. So some of the early warning indicators that we determined we should be looking at is benchmark data, classroom assessment data, historical assessment data, kindergarten screener for our incoming kindergartners, PVAS data, which is important for our, our eighth graders that are transitioning to ninth grade. We're looking at attendance. We're looking at input from the students, especially our older students. They can have some agency in the support that they're receiving in the buildings. And if they're expressing concerns, then we take that into consideration as we are discussing supports for them. And then input from the guardians. So one thing that when I'm in the meetings, I'm always driving the point home as we're talking about students is let's contact the parent and tell them next steps. So if we have this plan in place, the parent should be an active participant in what we're doing and knowing that this is what we're putting in place, this is for how long, and that we will contact you. If it's working, then we'll let you know it's working. If it's not, we will let you know what the plan is as we move forward. But we really want our parents and guardians to have an active role in this process, which I think we were lacking in that last year. We're having constant dialogue from the start, from those grade team meetings where we're noticing the concern, and then if we need to move a student through the tiers. So some of our early warning indicators for behavior, we're looking at our Swiss data and our office discipline referrals, a universal screener, which I will talk to you about. In the next slide, we're looking at attendance and academic risk. Ms. Keene, I'm just gonna interrupt you for one second. Mm -hmm. What does Swiss stand for? Our school-wide information system. Thank you. So this school year, we are utilizing universal screener, which is being implemented this week in the beginning of next. Um, and so we wanted an additional data source outside of Swiss, our school-wide information system, um, to be able to determine if a student is at risk for needing some behavioral support. So we are going to be implementing a student risk screening scale, internalizing and externalizing behavior, which is housed in Lincoln. It is, I would say, a pretty simple um, screener that our teachers are actually going to be implementing. It is not student-based. The teacher based on their knowledge of the student, uh, goes through 12 indicators to see if a student is high risk, low risk, moderate risk, and then a composite score is calculated at the end of the screener, um, and then goes into Linkit where it'll the student will be listed as moderate, low, or high. We're not using this to determine solely if a student goes into MTSS. It's just one additional data source to support if a student needs some behavioral support. We're still looking at the Swiss data, and this is just an additional tool. Uh, we are also working with the intermediate unit this year for a personal, um, I guess a personal screening scale or um, universal screener that's more individualized. So we're gonna be having a larger conversation with them once this screener is done, and then they're going to look how they can connect it to just doing an individual. So if we do have a student who is high risk, 
And then we have some additional early warning indicators, especially the parent input, student input, that there's some, some concerns and struggles along with the SWIS data that we can look into implementing the actual individual screener that the student can do, which then drives what support we actually provide for them. So within a framework, we have clearly determined how we are moving students between the tiers. And so then we have documentation that is required and necessary, and then what data should be collected to determine what tier they need to either move down or up. So from tier one to tier two, again, we're looking at the benchmark data classroom assessments, what tier one interventions have been implemented for at least 30 days with progress monitoring, and then something new that we have put in place this school year is a SMART goal. So we know we can't address every need if a student has multiple, but we need to have something that's measurable to see what is working. So we're going to focus on one of the, the main issues that a student may be having, create a SMART goal towards that, and as the student either is completing the SMART goal or not completing the SMART goal, we'll determine how they move through the tiers. And so then we have our tier two to tier three movement, where again, we're looking at the SMART goal and we're looking at the progress monitoring data, and we're looking for at least six weeks of data to determine if we need to move the student um, through the tiers. <clears throat> and so the ultimate goal is to move them back down. So then we have our, our framework for that, which really is completion of the SMART goal. This is a list, not exclusive, but it's some of our resources that are at the disposal of our teachers and our interventionists as we are putting in strategies for our students. Uh, for our elementary students, for ELA, we have WIN, we have IXL, we have Foundations and Wonders. Uh, for math, we have WIN as well, IXL Division. For SEL, Social Emotional Learning, we have Second Step, which um, a lot of our teachers uh, who did not access it for the past two years are reaching out this year so they can utilize some of those lessons within their classrooms. And then through Aldersgate, we have a social emotional curriculum called Too Good for Drugs, which I did uh, mention to you all last school year. We would be doing that again through Aldersgate. And then, of course, PBIS. And I didn't mention PBIS is our tier one for behavior support. So in PBIS, a lot of the incentives and initiatives that we put in place in the buildings, it's driven by our Swiss data. And then um, if that is not working with a particular student, that's when they get referred up to tier two based on other data sources along with PPIS. But that is our tier one meeting where tier one is PLCs and grade team meetings. Tier one for behavior is PPIS. In the high school we have, it was community lunch when I did this, but it's lunch and learn now um, as one of the interventions, IXL, Gisela, um, community lunch for math, IXL, and vision, and that is for algebra one, two, and geometry. So these are our tier two interventions, very similar as far as our academic resources um, for our social emotional resources for tier two. We once again have seven step, which can be small group instruction. Um, our board certified behavior analyst is a tier two intervention. He can do informal behavior observations. And so that is considered a tier two support. He also can do groups, but we do have other resources for that. So he's a, a lot of his time is doing those informal observations for our students. And then for all of our levels, uh, we have staff liaisons in all of our buildings um, and they they're there twice a week and they provide social emotional support for our students. And then tier three, again, similar academic interventions and similar um, SEL interventions as well with the SAP liaisons and the BCDA. So this year we created a new referral form. I was not gonna put all 75 pages on the presentation for you all, but that's just to show it's a very comprehensive uh, referral form. It is strengths-based, and one thing that we learn in this field is we should not get together and focus on the problem. We focus on what the student's strengths are. And so the first question on the referral form is exactly that. What are the student's strengths? It is content-specific. It's broken down by math and ELA, and specifically <coughs> within that, what are the issues that they're seeing academically for the student? And then there's a comprehensive list of interventions and strategies. So the teacher goes through, and they indicate what interventions or strategy, strategies they've already put in place, for how long, and was it effective? So that when it comes to those tier two, tier three, advanced tiers meetings, we're not 
talking about the backgrounds. We have all the background on the referral form, and then we're able to just implement the different interventions and the strategies. And it can be used as a reference, I would say, because it is a comprehensive list of strategies and interventions. If the teacher hasn't tried something, it may give them an idea as they work through the referral form. Um, this referral form mirrors the referral form that's in Linkit. Our goal is to transition this whole process so that our data can be housed in Linkit. And so to get our teachers acclimated and used to the form, I decided to just take it, make it a Google form for now. And so when we finally make that transition, it's not a surprise. The length isn't an issue. They're all used to completing the form. We have a new agenda form. It's very similar to the form that we use for our PBIS meetings. Um, it looks like that is a little small, but it is a working record where we have our student information, what interventions have been implemented, the date that the student was brought up, who is responsible for the intervention and the implementation of the intervention, the goals are listed, the timeline, and what is the outcome and the update when we discuss the student at a follow-up meeting. And you'll see new referrals will be listed, old referrals. It's broken down by the tiers for tier two and tier three and then any housekeeping items for our meetings. <clears throat> we have a new progress monitoring form. Um, so when we do implement our strategies and interventions, um, our, whoever is responsible for that will then have access to this document. So this can then be sent to the um, advanced tiers <clears throat> meeting team. And so they know what interventions were put in place and for how long and was it effective. So this is just a tool for us, another data keeping tool um, so that we can make sure that our interventions that we're putting in place are done with fidelity and we know the timeline and we know how effective it was. A lot of times we just mention it and then we don't have anything to back it up, no written documentation about what we actually did and this will provide us with that. So this leads me to some of the additional resources that we have in our buildings. I'm always excited to report on that. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we have our SAP counselors through Aldersgate, which is a constant for us. Um, but over the last couple of years, we have expounded upon that partnership. So we have SAP counselors in all of our buildings, K-12, through and they are there two days a week, which is a great resource. Um, elementary did not always have that, so they're very grateful uh, for that particular service. Uh, through some grant work, last year we started with a crisis interventionist through the Lincoln Center. Um, she started at the second half of the school year. Um, and I would say her honeymoon is over and she is very busy this school year, but she has been um, really instrumental and really helpful in those crisis moments when we need someone to come and provide de-escalation. And then where I think she's actually very useful if she can do the follow-up. So a lot of times our counselors, they are on to the next crisis, next situation. They have students that they need to see on a consistent basis. She's able to do that follow-up with the family and to see if services need to be put in place, she can assist with setting that up, making sure that the family is following through. So with an additional grant, we have two crisis workers. So our Tyler Sawyer is our K through six crisis worker. And then Mr. Rick Bell is servicing our seven through 12 students. They have the perfect personalities for the grade levels that they're working with. Uh, Mr. Bell is a football coach, very large presence great go-getter. He said his first day here, barely anybody knew him. He was in the bathroom, so everybody needs to get to class. And so he has that type of personality. So he's been working out really well in our 7 through 12. Um, not only do they come in in a time of crisis, but they also run groups in our buildings when necessary. Um, Mr. Bell is running groups out of Cedarbrook uh, for students that just need that additional mentoring support and just social emotional support. We partnered with Four Walls Counseling Agency at Elkins Park to give them some additional support as well. Um, that is a male clinician who was there three days a week and a female clinician who was there one day a week. They are also running groups and individual counseling um, along with the SAP counselor that's at Elkins Park as well. We are working with our mentoring groups, Make the Distinction and Girls Achieve. Make the Distinction is at Cedarbrook in the high school and Girls Achieve is at the middle school. And so how we are implementing this district-wide, we had our leadership week where the framework was um, discussed with the principals. We had a nice dialogue on how this could be implemented. And then I think the real work has started this year, attending the meetings, working through the kinks, noticing like, okay, 
this early warning indicator needs to change. We need to kind of tweak this a little bit, um, working on these forms and making sure they're working correctly. Uh, so it's it's been a journey. It's been enjoyable. And I really have enjoyed the work that we're doing. Each meeting that I go to is getting better and better every week. Um, and I'm a process girl. And I feel like, you know, we now have a sound process and we're going to work the process this year. And I think it'll be really impressive as we continue to work through it. Um, so the buildings are using the forms cohesively, the referral forms and the progress monitoring forms and the meeting agenda. And if they're not using the agenda, then when I'm in the meeting, I'm sending them the agenda. And I said, this is what you need to use in order to keep track of what you're discussing in your meetings. And all of our buildings have had MCS, MCSS meetings already this school year. They're either held weekly or bi-weekly. And again, we try to attend as many as we can as long as they're not scheduled at the same time. Any questions? Great, thank you so much. Is is is, is Miss Miss <laughs> um, That was really informative. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up to questions um, from board members first. So, um, are you finding that the children, the students, and their parents are receptive to the support and this process? I do, and so. Even as it pertains to parents that I wouldn't say jump the gun, but are like, I want my child tested. It's good that we have this framework in place because we can say, we would like to try this first. And this is what this looks like. And this is what this can do. Mm -hmm. And then the parent is usually agreeable because all we really want is to know what is happening and what interventions are to address the needs that we're seeing in our child. So <clears throat> if we say, you know, outside of that, we have supports. Mm -hmm. um, I find that the parents are actually very receptive to it. Good. <laughs> <It's right. clears throat> I uh, appreciate the overview uh, over the last year. You I, you may have been kidding, maybe not, when you said it was a hot topic <laughs> issue, but it, over the last year and a half, to be honest, whether it's strategic planning, we're talking about continuous improvement, and I even appreciate that you started off with the mission, because inspiration and resources, that's really at the heart of the MTSA uh, process. So I appreciate that we have, we've been hearing one, we need to get the process, the systems in place. Then it was, it's in the works. Don't worry, it's coming, it's coming. And then now we're here today. So it's certainly encouragement, motivating to see uh, systems and standards in place for how those resources are distributed. Um, I do have a question with, when it comes to the SSRIE, mm -hmm. I think it is. Um, and I, you already answered some of them in terms of how it operates. But um, could you share what's the connection between, given that teachers are reporting um, or responding to the assessment, uh, does it have any connection to like trauma-informed care or any other training and development that gets to like how behaviors are perceived? Um, am I making sense in my question? You are. Um... Our hope and our plan is that all of our teachers have some type of you know trauma sensitivity as they are completing it but just like this is a work in progress so is that um we worked with the university of penn through their consortium and we have a trauma toolkit and so we will be rolling that out once we get all the proper approvals um this is like a, a new endeavor that we worked on so i'm saying that to say we're always evolving when it comes to that and making sure that our teachers are always trauma-informed. So as they're completing the screener, they're keeping that in mind as they're completing it. And I always want to emphasize, it's just one data source. We're not making any decisions solely based on that. Thanks. I have a question, but after. I was intrigued by that, connecting it on Link, Link It. Mm -hmm. So Link It, as I understand it, is for academic performance. Is that no? No. Um, they have Dr. Riley can speak a yeah. lot more eloquently, but they have intervention manager, and so this is a new endeavor for us where you can now put behavioral data um, into Linkit. What What is Linkit other than that though? Is it Is it for Isn't it the tracking tool when? The so, generally speaking, Linkit is our data warehouse. Uh, yeah. So and there's it, a, if we are curating data, it lands in Linkit. Whether that's academic or otherwise, did we not? Uh, I, we've gotten a lot of presentations over the years, and my mind isn't what it used to be. So um, the the Lincoln presentation that we had that showed when kids did certain number of problems, 
that's all in there. Okay. Yep. And then, and that was what I was getting at. So this could give us the ability to correlate academic performance with a teacher's assessment of the student's trauma. Like, uh, what are we assessing there? Assessing their internalizing and externalizing behaviors. Behaviors, behaviors. Mm -hmm. That's so behaviors can correlate or maybe not correlate to grades and, and, and academic performance. And this is all data that we'll have and then be able to massage and see trends. And that's fascinating to me. And that that is going to be in the works as this progresses mm -hmm. in one data source. It's fascinating and gives you a lot of opportunity. And Link it has evolved since we first bought into Link it because we purchased it as a data warehouse only. Okay. And we were able to create assessments within Link it and that data <clears throat> is automatically populated within the tool. But they've changed and they recognize the need for additional data other than just pure academic. And so they've created additional features that we're now utilizing to bring all that data together. So ideally, if there's a piece of data attached to a student, it should be Link it. And then trends over time in within four students and then also among students. There's a lot that that could hopefully give us to work with over time. That's really, really fascinating. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. Sure. All right. I think you said we each get one question. So <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, the first question is about with the presentation you were going through within the FDSS tier one, tier two, and tier three, and I noticed a fair amount of repetition of what is a tier one, what is a tier two, and what is a tier three in terms of the curriculum supports. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm trying to understand. How that works. It's very simple. So um, tier two is group, small mm -hmm. group. Okay. So you can use one of those curriculum resources in a small group. And then tier three is individualized. Okay. So you would still use that resource, but it would just be one-on-one -on -one instruction with the student. And so if you are talking about counseling support, you have a group that you're working on anxiety or executive function. <laughs> and if that is not working in that group setting, then they're getting individual counseling. Okay. Or we're referring them out to one of our social workers to something outside a little bit more intense. Okay. And would do you see, I mean, I, I this is truly a naive question. Is there opportunities for specialized curriculum that, you know, is ideal for tier two intervention support. And, and so and is that where we might go? In that's the, the excitement of this process. Right. This year we're working on the framework, right. making sure everything is cohesive as possible, <laughs> still individualized for the buildings, but we're working on the framework. And then as we start to master the framework, then we're looking into our interventions. Okay. And so the room to grow for interventions, getting teacher feedback, you know, administrative feedback on what they want to see and what they need for our tier two and tier three interventions. And then my other question, which is actually related, but maybe more on the tier one side. Mm -hmm. And I, I admit, I'm a little more dangerous because I just went to, we were just at the PSBA leadership conference yesterday. <laughs> my, on a literacy <laughs> uh, journey mm -hmm. meeting. And there was this slide that has MTSS in the middle and then HQIMs, which stands for, I understand, high quality instructional materials, which I assume is talking about the tier one level of high quality instructional materials. And I was just curious, is that also part of a few, you know, part of your thinking or, or evaluating for things that are for the tier one for that core, mm -hmm. does this framework help us evaluate where can we improve or where do we need to improve? Absolutely, and it goes back to that original slide based on data, if we need to move a tier two intervention to tier one. Okay. And so there's always that flexibility as you're looking at what your school needs to change your HQIMs. Yeah, that's what I heard. That's what, that's what I said. Yes, yeah, yeah, to yeah. update your HQIMs is based on the needs of your students. Okay. Because even if it does seem like it's it's more for um, a small group of students, why not make it for everybody if it seems to be effective and it's what they need? Got it. All right. I'm, oh, I, I do have that's one. <laughs> Uh, and this was just a brand, actually, I run, like three years ago at, at the BSBA conference, um, one of the sessions that it spoke to me was around universal screeners. And I remember asking a question about it. I got some pretty blunt feedback from 
administrative staff that there is risk of, with universal screeners in terms of um, labeling students as having social emotional needs, and it can can actually it can ironically turn into the opposite outcome that we want, and people students can be pre perceived in ways that maybe expectations are lowered. So I was just curious around how can we prevent that, and is that on you know what can be done, and is it through trainings? Exactly it's definitely about. through trainings and then, you know, just to emphasize, it's a temperature check. Sure. And so um, if you have, and you know, our, our administrators know their staff. And so if they see a data point, they're like, that's, that doesn't seem accurate. We're looking at this with data. We're looking at office discipline referrals. We need to make sure that's all in line with that particular data source that's through the screen. Well, thank you. And this isn't a question, but a statement. But I, I know that the success of these programs is going to ultimately come down to teacher supports mm -hmm. and how effectively they're trained on how to use interventions. And I think having us Glad there the at the work. meetings is helpful because right. then the questions that they have, we're able to ask, and they know um, there's pushback. Is this a district? -wide? Yes, this is a district. -wide <laughs> initiative. Like everybody's doing this, so I think that's helpful to have our presence there. So thank you. Mr. Fernandez, oh, Mr. Fernandez, and then don't let me forget about this same one. Yes, she has her hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a three clarifying questions, but uh, also a plus one to the progress um, okay. to where we are right now. So, awesome. Just as a comment, um, the clarifying questions for me is just so I understand. Uh, just some housekeeping stuff. SAP. Um, I, I, SAP. 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 Yes, Student SAP. Assistance Program. Got it. Thank you. No I, problem. I, I use uh, SAP for Perpetual Inventory Management. So whenever I see it, um, you know, maybe it's my problem. Um, anyway, um, and uh, you, state, you stated earlier uh, in the presentation uh, that yeah, uh, Gen Ed, BCBA, um, and then what was listed there was just BCBA. And I've heard that in a couple of different ways. So can you kind of delineate Gen Ed, BCBA from not, or is that a thing, or is that just a... It's a thing, because um, so we have, uh, I think, three or four board-certified behavior analysts, mm -hmm. but they function and they support our special education students uh, with emotional support needs and autistic support needs. So now we have one that is focused solely on our students that don't have that diagnosis, don't, don't have an IEP. And so um, where that's helpful is he can move with the student through the tiers and a tier three intervention for him would be an FBA. And so a lot of times when our students are referred them for testing for behavioral needs, we don't have an FBA. And that just gets backlogged, you know, in addition to the testing that we need to do the FBA. But at, with us working this system, they would already have one by the time that they would go into the testing process. Functional uh, behavioral analysis. Sorry. Thank you. I was going to say a lot. Chat. Work in a very acronym heavy uh, <laughs> field, so I understand. Uh, thank you, Jen, sure. by the way. Um, and then the, uh, thank you for that. I, I, I know we've talked about BCBA uh, <laughs> to special education, and so I wanted to. So now we have one that's for Jen. Okay, got it. And they run around every school building is this every school grade? building okay he is every school building okay and he's doing a phenomenal job got, yeah. got some good energy in him okay and <laughs> um and then the last just uh from the smart goal perspective i saw two time frames that were specified one was 30 days the other one was six weeks mm -hmm. 30 I, days I come up the, with that like is that you you don't want to wait too long for like a tier one to tier two, but you want a plan to work when you get from tier two to tier three. So that was the determination for the time. So 30 days for the initial intervention at that lower level, and then six weeks with the more in, intensive intervention put in place. You want to okay. give that time to work. <laughs> okay, that clarifies things for me. Thank you very much. You. I appreciate the, uh, the presentation. Ms. Haywood? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. King, for your presentation. And Charles, you must have been reading my mind because I have a similar question um, as it relates to the SMART goals. So I really like the flexibility of being able to go up and down in the tiers, depending on obviously the progress of the student and the interventions that are provided. And my question relates to, let's say a student was in tier two and they had SMART goals and they were going through that period of observation and reflection and data review, and something maybe happened or was triggered during that time frame 
do you modify those SMART goals? And if so, does that time frame of observation then start over again? Yes. So we would modify depending on the need. And yes, the, the time frame would start over. And I didn't indicate, um, it kind of goes to your question, based on the student's need, they don't have to start at tier one. So you look at their early warning indicators and if it's determined that they need to move up into tier sooner, they can start at a tier two or a tier three based on the severity of either the academic or the behavioral need. Thank you. I only had one question. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Uh, okay, um, then we'll, we'll go out to the public. And I see there's one in the q and There is. Uh, Ms. Johnson asked the question, as a mom with a child with an IEP, is there any plan for children who are unable to sit in class and listen to instructions? I'm noticing a change in my child's classmates being loud, making it hard for them to learn. Um, do we have the location where that person is from the district? So that would not necessarily fall under MTSS per se, um, and is more so I would direct Ms. Johnson to contact that administrator. I'm not sure what grade or what school was that mentioned in the Glenside Elementary. Glenside. So I would definitely have her reach out to Dr. Robinson. Any other? That was the only question. No other question. questions uh, online. Okay. Do we, have, do we have questions from the audience? Right. Uh, Ross Whiting, Buckner's Park. Uh, Ms. Keene, this is an enormous lift uh, to get an MTSS run, a model up and running in the school district. And so kudos to you and the people you work with for getting this rolling. I have a couple of uh, thoughts, comments for you. The first is uh, universal screen is a critical part of this work. I know using multiple data sources to try to figure out uh, how to strike the, the students out. Are you planning to, first, I, I, I'm kind of interested, A, where you are in the process of using the universal screen through looking at that data, and then are you looking at that data individually by, by, um, by uh, S R S S I E and then Swiss and then academics, or are you kind of making a composite score and, and striating out kids so that the top 20%, 5% kids are pushed into the appropriate level? So first, where are you on universal screen? You want to talk about that a little bit? Okay. We are just implementing it this week. Okay, great. So, <laughs> so this week. This okay. week, yes. So all of our principals got the training That's in August one. and <laughs> just implementing it this week. So then we will have an answer for you next year. Okay. <laughs> um, and so with the SS, SRSS IE, that's a teacher report um, and it's externalizing behaviors. And so it would benefit uh, kids who, the teachers knowing the kids and seeing them kind of every day. With thinking about your our kids who change classes in seven through twelve, what's the strategy for for that in in those grades so that you're looking at teachers who have the most contact with the kids who can do nothing the best? So the principals made the determination for our seven through twelve grades. They picked a period, and so okay. the teacher who teaches that period then goes on to link it. They select the period, and then all the students are pulled up for that period. Awesome. Um, and so the with the the other last question about the universal screen, and then I'm done. Um, are you planning to, to pull the kids out by need in specific areas? You're going to look across areas? It's a composite score. So we it's a composite score. Yep, okay. a composite score. So it's not broken down by the different areas. Are you separating academics and the behavior as two composite scores, or are they one composite score? And then you're the Academics there. isn't screened in the universal screener that I discussed. Just behavior. Just behavior. Universal screen. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, last I last last question. I had another question that popped into my head. Did you consider at all using any kind of student self reports for universal screens and yes. logistics? So reports? we are. This is like I said, our first go around with this particular screener, and then working with a contact from Project Aware at the IU yeah. to do a student led screener. So we're going to see cool. how that can fit in. We're still in the very beginning stages of it, but excited about the work to see how it can be effective. Awesome. Uh, it is a huge lift. Kudos to you and your team. I know it's going to be, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing. I know you said it's a hot topic, but I really believe it really is to get this up and running effectively. So congratulations on the work that's been so done, uh, done so far and good luck to the principals and staff. There. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> could I just, yes, just comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> so at WinCode, it's been a little bit of a slow roll. Jim yourself. Taylor, mm -hmm. uh, 
I live it out with fart. <laughs> Some hours of the day. Other hours of the day, I live in Winco. <laughs> I'm in Redfield, Winco Elementary. Um, we have been very intentional in our rollout of the process at Winco. So it started with me going through the form by myself just to see what was in there, rolling it out to our MTSS team, having us go through. Um, making up a scenario, making up a student and rolling through the, and saying, mm, here's the king, here's the king, here's the king. Let's call him this king. <laughs> Let's get her to solve it. So that's been great. Um, we had our first round yesterday and today of student talk around um, students who are presenting with some challenges. I was intentional about waiting six weeks because some teachers say, this gave me special ed. I know it the first hour of school. And so I was very intentional about saying, and when you come to the meeting, don't come with just your hunch. Come with some data that supports what you're saying. So the level of professional discourse the last couple of days has been much deeper than I experienced as a teacher or an administrator, a new administrator. Um, and the level of collabor collaborative talk around, have you tried this intervention at tier one? Have you tried this intervention? Have you thought about X, Y, Z? Has been terrific. And then we have reached out to parents based on this initial round. Um, I have not made those calls. I've encouraged the teachers to be the first line. And then I'll follow up in conference time in a few more weeks if there's still issues that they want some support with. So the plan is working. We have some students that um, were presented in June of last year that we didn't really have a chance to problem solve on. Um, I alerted those receiving teachers these students were brought up at MTSS. Are you seeing any concerns this year? Often we're moving them to a tier two level because they there were some strategies and interventions in place. So there's a lot of fluidity. There's a lot of moving parts. We're all trying to get our minds wrapped around the new model. Um, but the evidence, the anecdotal evidence of the last 48 hours is that it's very, very positive. Mm -hmm. And so kudos to you, Ms. King, for your hard work, because I know it's not easy to have me calling you every 20 minutes, <laughs> <laughs> let alone the rest of my colleagues calling you in the office. So thank you. And it, I just am convinced that we are going to see a, a lessening of the students who are referring to special ed to address our, our overrepresentation, our disproportionality issues. And I think by having a very intentional process, the conversation and data will then drive what we're doing in the classrooms. And teachers are getting used to this new model that they have a responsibility around intervention as well, that it's not just um, let's take Jim Taylor to MTSS and wipe our hands of him and let it become a special ed issue or let it become an issue for our interventions. You're no, you're going to do some of the tier one interventions, which is why there's such an emphasis now, particularly at Wing Code, around intentional small group instruction and having that really built into our schedule this year. So it's working. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Hi, Mia Blitz team. I live in Elkins Park. Um, and I just actually want to ask something that goes off of just the very end of what you were saying, which is when is this happening in terms of interventions in small groups? I know that our elementary schools have WIN, and I know that um, CHS has Lunch and Learn. What does EP and Cedarbrook have that gives them that small group time? Or how do they both have Cedarbrook and EP both have one? Okay. Yeah. 
And I know that um, EP has Eagle Hour, where they do a lot of SEL work there. Awesome. I was thinking more of academic stuff, like when are we pulling mm -hmm. small groups? But they both have one. Awesome. But one of the paradigm shifts what, that I'm working on at Winco is that small group instruction is a sound pedagogical approach. <clears throat> And it is not um, confined solely to the intervention 40, 45 minutes. That is part of your reading block, as part of your math block. There should be some intentionality around small group instruction as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Schultz? Can I ask a clarifying question? NTSS. <coughs> itself is not an intervention, correct? No. It is the whole, it's a whole shebang, right? Yeah. So every every everybody at all moments is somewhere on the triangle mm -hmm. of NTSS. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and do we have a sense of what the tar like I guess this is this can feed into the school improvement plans or at least it's measurable in terms of who what percentage of students are in not each at this stage because but eventually oh you know, eventually absolutely and that could maybe help us understand not necessarily performance of schools, but maybe performance of the curriculum, right? Because if our curriculum is okay, this yep. is starting to click. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions from the board? Um, I just have one question or comment that someone already sort of asked, which was I can I can see how this can all work on the elementary school level. I can see how it can work at EP and Cedar Brook. I'm still having trouble kind of seeing how it can work at the high school level. So it can work. Um, they have started this year with their meetings. They're meeting weekly. Um, and again, we have to continue to um, increase what our interventions are. But um, they had a heavy lift. It's a larger yeah. building. And I like how they started with all of their retained students. So they are going through one by one all their retained students in their meetings. And then they are assigning them an intervention during that lunch and learn or a check in with their counselor. So it's baseline, but they kind of have to start from the ground and then expound upon it as the year goes on. But it can absolutely work, especially with that lunch and learn time. Um, utilized correctly, they can get intervention in that time frame. And when you say they, like who's the group, I guess? So the list that I provided okay. in the presentation is very much so the high school list, all the counselors, uh, most of the assistant principals, the principal uh, kind of leads the meeting, and then you have the psychologist as well. And then um, Mr. Burke, our BCPA, the board certified behavior analyst, he attends the meetings as well. And our parents brought in, at what point sort of our parents brought Not in? Not in the meeting, but as the interventions are being put in place, parents are contacted to let them know what the what the school is working on with the student. Because I could totally see someone that I know, my child, perhaps, like, like this could be happening at, at the high school level, and I would know nothing about it. You would it. know. If they're okay. in the MTSS process, there would be contact either by a teacher or a counselor or a grade level administrator. Okay, all right. Dr. Smith. Oh, Dr. Smith. Good evening, everyone. In addition to what Ms. King just shared, I also wanted to bring to everyone's attention that we did um, purchase a new plugin in PowerSchool to assign students to um, interventions and to get them extra help. So with that new plugin, it's a nice way for students and teachers to track who's asking for help. And it can also trigger um, teachers to request students to come to meet with them um, for help. And parents can also ask their students to see that particular element of power school to see if students have been invited. And it also um, shows us whether they actually showed up and attended. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Keen. This was really very informative, um, and I know a long, long time in the in the works. Um, <laughs> so, thank you. I'm really excited to see how this all works out at the building level for for all of our students. Thank you. So, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.